Hey everyone, how are you doing? This is Brian Kramer. We're back for another H to H chat this week, and I am very excited about this one. Um, we're going to go ahead and shoot the link out this time for YouTube. Uh, uh, Susie, if you don't mind, we had a couple people ask just for it up front, just in case. Um, so go ahead and shoot that out. But before um, we get started, I wanted to um, just tell everybody how much fun this was this weekend getting ready for this chat. I've never seen so many people want to um, be a part of the chat as much as I did this weekend. And even more so, this whole meme about hats going off was fun. And we're about to show you something. Mark's about to show you something that um, had me uh, cry, almost uh, cry, crying and laughing at the same time. But before we do that, I wanted to uh, just say a quick hello, hello to my co-host, Susie, live from New York. Susie, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Brian. Doing well. And Good. I see that I see that Mark has uh, his Giants hat. I wish I would have realized because I'm a Washington Nationals fan. So, um, booyah! Ooh. Oh, gotta say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Very bad. <laughs> How many and World Series have they won again? <laughs> Ooh, that close. Oh. That close. <laughs> <laughs> And we are off and running. So, um, so during the show, uh, Mark, I want to explain something to you real quickly. Um, we have this, this game. So if you can strategically place the word human into your sentences, um, the last person's record was at 9. You will have to do 10 to beat the record uh, in the total time. Uh, we are counting Jay Bear, um, Joel Com. Um, Chris Hewer and a whole bunch of other great people. So now it's your turn to take the challenge. Are you willing to take the challenge? I'm willing to take the challenge. And I'm going to attempt to do it without it feeling awkward. So Good. the word human is going to come out all over the place. <laughs> you like that? Just like that. And that's what you're going to hear every time you say it. Okay, I'm ready. All right, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Yolton, um, very good friend, and um, also the VP of Digital, which includes web, social, mobile, video, so you can rest medicine, at yes. Cisco. Um, now, he, he says his views are his own, not necessarily those of his employer, but I think he has uh, pretty congruent views, if you ask me. He's also a husband, a dad, a captain. I'd like to yeah. know more about that. And, um, and for those of you who don't know, check out his profile on his Twitter uh, bio. And I, I think that's your motorcycle, is it not? That is my motorcycle, yes. I rode it yesterday. So um, lots of stuff. You have uh, a lot of stuff going on. Anyway, welcome to the HJH chat. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Susie, too, for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Super psyched for this one. Good. So um, before, before we get into the hats, I wanted to ask you, what are you the captain of? Yeah, the captain. Uh, I'm a grandfather, but I, I'm far too young, and my wife is far too young to be called grandmother or grandmy or some name like that. So we left it up to my our daughter and son-in-law to give us better names. And so my wife is Lolly, which is some sort of French, sort of French-sounding grandmother name. And then I left it up to my son-in-law, which is always dangerous, to give me a nickname. Uh, and he went back to Robert De Niro and Meet the Parents or one of those movies. And, uh, and the dad says, call me Captain. And so he said, ah, oh, that, that works for you. So you're going to be called Captain. And now I've really come to love it because now as I'm walking through the grocery store or something, my grandsons who are 12 and 8 will, will yell out, Captain, Captain. And, of course, it's to me. And so it sounds kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> it's a better name than Poppy or some, some word like that. So I'm Captain. Oh, that's awesome. I love that story. Yeah. Um, so it's funny. Ironically, I was having my son call me Captain O Captain this weekend if he wanted anything, but there you go. Um, it's not as cool a story as yours. So um, let's, let's, um, let's see so that I, uh, everyone on the HGA chat can enjoy your, your, your hat display. Do you, do you want to display the hats before we get yeah, started? Absolutely, absolutely. To get us kicked off. Over the weekend, one of the folks on Twitter was suggesting that we wear hats or thinking caps or something. And so that's how we got started with this whole hat thing. So I pulled a few hats out of the closet this morning just to get us started. So, of course, we have the World Series winning uh, San Francisco Giants represented here. Um, I think three World Series in the past five years, if I'm, if anybody's counting. So that's kind of cool. 
Um, but I really love football a lot more, so we represent the San Francisco 49ers as well. I'm looking forward to the preseason. Don't know what's going to happen because the team has turned over so much. So I got the Niners here. Sorry, East Bay, I don't have the Oakland Raiders. Um, we also jumped on the bandwagon in the past couple of months, and we've got the uh, we've got the Golden State Warriors. This one's very flattering. That's the why I like this one the best because it makes me look <laughs> like 10 IQ points smarter. But I've got the Golden State Warriors uh, and the uh, and the I guess that doesn't count. Um, this one is good to wear to I think a jazz festival. So this is good if you just want to sort of do the jazz thing. We also have beat poets here in San Francisco. So that's for if you want to do that. And then if you're going for an evening out on the town, this very suave looking hat. Uh, it might even have a feather in it somewhere. Anyhow, um, this one and all of these uh, make me look more human, more accessible, more engaging. Thank you. That was pretty smooth, right? Yeah, that was good. That I like was that good. one. That was good. Oh, man. So how about this? Why don't we lay down a challenge for everybody real quick on the uh, H2H chat. If you guys wouldn't mind taking a picture, so that would be a selfie, of yourself with your hat and use the hashtag H2H chat. I'm sure Mark would love to play back the tweet chat later on and see all the hats you are wearing. Absolutely. So, um, absolutely. Please make sure that you tweet a, a picture of yourself with the hat and the hashtag H2H chat. Okay. Time to get serious. Yes. Put on the serious face. Let, let me put on my other hat. Be good to people. Oh, that's nice. Very nice. <laughs> I'll keep this part on. It's, it's funny. When you wear this hat in public, you actually have to be good to people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so, Mark, it is really, really... That was fun. But it was really good to, um, to connect with you and also uh, have you on the show. And so I wanted to kick this off um, just by explaining a little bit, because the topic of this, this show today is past, present, and future of digital. Uh -huh. And you and I have had some really great conversations around it, but not nearly enough to, I think, explore really um, not just where things have been, but where they're going. Mm -hmm. So um, why, don't we, when, why don't we take a, just a quick trip back and have you tell us about your story, a little bit of background on your own marketing career just to set things off. Sure, I won't even uh, I won't even really go digital yet. Um, I'll just start with the career. Uh, I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Uh, went to school out in Amish country, uh, very undigital. Um, where I went to university was a place where it was a legitimate excuse if you say I got stuck behind a horse and buggy, and that's why I'm late. Uh, so that's how undigital it was. It wasn't a thousand years. It was just Amish country. Um, then I took the first job that where somebody made the made me an offer, and that was the Prudential Insurance Company. I even started as a claims agent um, just because I wanted a job, and I didn't want to live in in my parents' house any longer. Because through college, I realized that that wasn't you know any good anymore. I needed to be off on my own. So I took my first job, uh, moved into the marketing organization soon after, uh, which is where I really wanted to be. Um, and somebody plucked me out of a group and said, hey, I think you belong in marketing. You're obviously not a good at this. Maybe you'll be good at something else. <laughs> um, so they put me into marketing. And then I realized, gosh, you know, insurance, not the most innovative and exciting place. So why don't I try to find a tech job? The big tech company in Philadelphia at the time was Unisys, which some of you, if you're old enough, you might remember Sperry, Burroughs, some of those old names. Um, the combination of those two is Unisys. It's still an old mainframe company that's still sort of plugging along, um, still going. So I went there for a while. I did a stint out in the field in doing field marketing. It was supposed to be four months. It turned into four years. And it was a very long commute, like an hour and a half wow. each way. So th I went to the boss at the end of this and said, oh, please let me out of this. It's been four years. I, we thought it was going to be four months. Now, you know, I you know, bought several cars and lots of tires in order to get me through this. Um, he said, okay, you did your thing. Uh, choose a job, any job, and I will help you get it. And uh, it was around 1994, 95, and I said, this new thing called the Internet looks kind of interesting. It might not be a flash in the pan. I'd like to try my hand at that. And so I went to work in the Unisys uh, Corporation um, web department, whatever that was. It, at the moment, it was probably three people and a couple IT folks uh, trying to figure out how to do HTML. Um, 
And then it didn't take me long to realize that Bluebell, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia, is not going to be the center of the universe for this new thing called the Internet. So my wife and I moved our kids across the com country and came to the Silicon Valley. We essentially chose the center and said, okay, San Jose, boink, that's where we're going to live and that's where we're going to look for jobs. We came out here without jobs, really. Um, I quickly found one at Sun Microsystems. That was a great ride um, where I did some e-business work there. Um, then there was the dot-com bust that happened, um, and uh, everything imploded. I sort of took a little time and licked my wounds and went off in a corner for a little while, and then headed off to uh, PeopleSoft. Mm -hmm. Was there for a year. PeopleSoft was be was acquired by Oracle. Went there for a year. Escaped to SAP for about eight years, uh, and then came to Cisco almost two years ago. So it's been thirty so years. Uh, and and really, the the internet part of it, the web part of it, started in ninety four, ninety five, and has been the last twenty years or so. It's been fantastic. Man, um, so you you have obviously uh, done a few things in your career. Um, I uh, some of um, them successfully. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that sounds like a very Silicon Valley uh, story. Um, you know, it's a lot of different changes and a lot of different things. And um, I'm I'm curious, what what is one thing that, or even actually a couple of things that you've seen change that were the 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 points of um, the tipping point, if you will, yeah. uh, the, the things that um, that changed in your career uh, or or in the environment as your career uh, uh, went on. Yeah, the, I guess, well, let's just start with the digital stuff in the, in the mid to later 90s, let's say. Um, in those days, we didn't grow up with any of this digital stuff the way that kids or younger folks do today. Um, there was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no web. None of that existed. Um, so there were even some rudimentary things. Like I had the, if you, if you know somebody old enough, they'll, they'll know a story like this. I had the boss that had his secretary print out emails so that he could handwrite the answer on the bottom of the email, and then she would type them in as a response. So I had that. We had people in the office who didn't know how to use a mouse because a mouse was a new technology even back then. And people were holding it up. I remember one guy in the class, an older guy, holding it up sort of like the TV remote control and couldn't figure out why this stupid mouse thing wasn't working for him. It wasn't moving on the screen. So even learning something as silly as how to use a mouse, I mean, gosh, that we learned that sort of out of the womb at this point. Um, we even had the debate within the office about should all employees be allowed to have the Internet, internet access at their desk? You know, God forbid they wow. were able to do that because then they would spend their whole day sort of surfing the web and surfing the web and surfing the net was the talk of the day. We And what is the ROI of having an internet access for every employee? Uh, shouldn't just a few people have that? So there was that. That was one, just to get over the hump of access. Then there were um, things like UI and what we would call user experience to, to us. I mean, we didn't even know where logos were supposed to go. Right now, we all know that when you go to a website, in the upper left corner is probably where the logo of the company should go, and that logo should take you back to the home page. We were all we were figuring that stuff out. We were figuring out. We were doing eye tracking and scanning and trying to figure out where should we put different things on a page. How does somebody read a page? Well, gosh, they don't actually read it. They skim it. They sort of skim it from top to bottom. They're looking for links. All these different things that we sort of take for granted right now that are just user experience or UI design kind of um, standards uh, that are expect expected now. Then we moved into something like, um, well, what is it that we can automate? Uh, you know, the, the first web sites were essentially digitized brochures. So, okay, we've done that. We can, we can, you know, digitize a brochure and put a brochure up, and that's our website. What else could we automate it? Automate e-commerce became a thing, and e-business became a thing. And e-business was really how do we change some business processes or business practices? Some of the things that wouldn't normally be done. Um, one of my, I guess, claims to fame back in the day at Sun Microsystems was um, transitioning the Sun Services organization to accept uh, online trouble tickets into the tech support organization and then giving customers this amazing ability to be able to track your, your tech support question 
on the web by yourself, like you could track a WebEx package. And that was seen as a big breakthrough back in the day, and now we take all of that stuff for granted. I would say that a couple of the things that we've done in the early days was we automated existing processes the way they already existed. And then in the later days, the day like now, we are trying to figure out new ways to innovate, ways that we can change business processes completely as opposed to just automating the past. Past. It's almost like uh, paving cow paths, right? That was the old way that you figured out where the road was going to go, see where the cow has made a path and pave that, or the people have made a path to the village. Pave that and you've got your first roads. And then you start thinking, well, gosh, shouldn't we have an interstate commerce or an interstate system with roads? And what about bridges and you know all this other stuff that's going to connect these things together? Now I think we're in that mode of thinking of of innovation rather than automating what already existed. I love that. Um, so that's interesting. The whole the uh, automation versus innovation. Mm -hmm. um, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that before. Um, uh, although I, I, I know the automation piece is, um, you know, something that everybody's trying to figure out, and um, and and obviously that plays really well with the theme of this chat, which is being human to human. Um, but how, how, you know, I, I know I realize this wasn't in our question set, but I'm actually curious. Sorry, I'm throwing you a curveball here. Um, yeah. how, how, how do you see that? How do you see the human approach versus the automation approach? Do you have kind of a personal um, approach approach for the, for the automation versus human like where's the balance there what's your, uh, what's your thinking? I think we're going to automate and have machines do the repetitive tasks the things where you could start with let's say um, uh, you know put widget a into slot B that's the first thing the second thing will be then we'll ha start to have some algorithms to take that away and then I think the machines are going to get smart enough um, so that we say, okay, machine, now learn how to do that better. Um, get more efficient, get more effective, and that, I think, is the path that we're going to take from automation to innovation. I think then the people, the humans among us, uh, get to do the real thinking portion of the, of the uh, problem. How do we do the problem solving? How do we think exponentially? How do we think outside the box? How do we think beyond the, the norm? I think that'll be the way that we go, so that we automate away the boring, repetitive, um, predictable stuff. At some point uh, in the future, I think the machines are going to get smart enough where they do uh, a better job and a faster job of thinking than the humans do, and that they're going to start to take over some things that we would normally do. I think we're going to end up doing the really higher level intelligence kind of work, and that machines take away all the drudgery. Uh, that's a great response. I love that. Um, that and and I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hope there are still some jobs left for us, and we want to see the underlords of the robots, right? <laughs> the underlords. Yes. Um, so, what things today make you excited about digital marketing? What I mean, I know we just talked about the future a little bit. We'll get back yeah. into the future. Yeah, yeah. But, but what about today? What what is what are you excited about today? Uh, today, well, I, I think I would generally say I'm excited about how far we've come, and I'm excited about how far we have yet to go because there is so much yet undone. Um, one of the things that Cisco's chief marketing officer Karen Walker says is that marketing is the last function to be industrialized and the first to be digitized. I hope that's true. That's what I'm here for and that's what the team is here for, is to digitize marketing and, and then sales and then supply chain and et cetera, but really to digitize the entire company of Cisco. But I think marketing gets to lead on this one, which I think is going to be really cool. Um, the ways that that transforms or transpires is that we start with some data and analytics. So I think we're going to see some really cool stuff about uh, data and analytics. Then automation is going to happen. Then we're going to start with better targeting and message customization to a particular individual. Or it, it'll start as a group of individuals. Then we'll get personalized down to one single person. We're going to get dynamic content, dynamic publishing with an audience of one. 
so that there's a bunch of content that could be created, but it's going to recognize what I respond to or people like me respond to or what I've responded to in the past, and it's going to be able to target to me. I'm, I'm excited about this whole idea of multi-channel or omni-channel where we won't be a person on the web and a person on Twitter and a person on Facebook and a person on LinkedIn and a person in real life, um, but that we are a person and that the machines, the, the automation, the systems will start to understand who we are, what motivates us, what interests us, what challenges we face, etc. can even anticipate some of the things that we have. So in part, I've gotten the opportunity, it's been amazing, to, to witness the first two decades, let's say, of digitization or the web and the internet. I'm going to get to see the next two de decades at least, I hope. Um, and I think how far we've come in those two and how, how far we have yet to go. The, um, at Cisco, we talk about the Internet of Everything. There's this, there's a, other folks might know it as the Internet of Things, but at Cisco, um, we add a couple uh, other elements to the Internet of Things. We talk about people, process, data, and things. That makes up the Internet of Everything. I think as we start to connect all these things together, the possibilities start to um, take people on this process. People, process, data, and things. People, Got process, it. data, and things equals the Internet of Everything. And I think all of those things, in, in essence, people take actions upon things which create uh, data which change a process. That's the way that we think about it, or one of the ways we think about it. As, we, as all of these things start to get connected and then start to react and um, be proactive in their interaction and engage with each other and engage with us, I think the, the next 20 years are going to be just extraordinary. So I'm looking forward to that. That's what's exciting. Being in the middle of all this is really cool. Being at a company like Cisco, and I'm sure some of the folks uh, who are watching and listening are, are building components of what's going to be the future. Being at the center of that is really extraordinary. It's like being, I don't know, helping the Wright brothers push their airplane down the, you know, down the runway at Kitty Hawk, the sand, right, the beach, um, or being part of the uh, sort of the industrial revolution or something. Being at the center of this is really, really cool. That's what's exciting. <laughs> so not much, I guess. Not much. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, man, the, so that could be its own show everything that you just said. I mean, there's so much there that you just went through. Um, the, the one area that, um, that I guess I'll, uh, I'll kind of pick on is, yeah. this, is the thing of, of personalization. Yeah. Because um, I think that's, um, it's, it's, I mean, I, we all get the definition of it, but the yeah. action of doing it is yeah. probably the hardest thing in the world. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, we still have things like personas. We haven't gotten down to the, a human, a person, an individual. We haven't gotten to that yet. Um, we still have personas and market segments, and we're start. We collectively are dabbling with you know individuals and being able to personalize. We can customize to an extent, but only to a certain extent. There, I mean, years ago people talked about an audience of one. We're not there yet. Um, we need the systems and the tools and the algorithms and the data and the analytics of that data. Um, we need all of those things in order to make personalization real. We're not there yet. Yeah, that's uh, that's going to be the interesting part is to see how that that unfolds. And when it does get here, it'll also be interesting to see where the creepy versus cool factor yeah. comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, there is this there is this potential for it to be really creepy. The first few times uh, you get really personalized messages, you're going to be creeped out, I think. Yeah. But, but we've gotten comfortable with that stuff over time very quickly. Like the whole Facebook uh, back in the day, right, the Facebook um, personalization and the Facebook privacy policy changes and all that. Yeah. Um, we were a little bit disturbed by those in the early days. But the more value we get out of something, the more willing we are to give up some of that privacy or data or information or control. I, I think as we see value, we say, okay, I'm willing to give you another inch. You know, I'm willing to give you another foot of rope to either personalize or not. And if it starts to get too much for us, we can always pull it back. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you know who Faith Popcorn is. Uh, she's, a, she's a futurist, and um, she wrote a book in 1984 
uh, called the Popcorn Report. She predicted that we'd all be cocooning right around now. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we could order things to have them delivered like Amazon and so on and so forth. Um, and, and now in the future, from today looking forward, she's, she's saying you know, that we'll be able to change things, our, our hair, hair color with, with a pill. And we're uh -huh. going we're, we're to solve things by sending robots into our body and have them fixed. And when you think about these things mm -hmm. that can do all these unimaginable, you know, these things, we imagine them happening overnight, but nothing ever happens overnight. It's all little right. increments of changes, which is what I think you're saying. Yes, and so I think so. That, that creepy part doesn't really enter into the mix too much. No, it, well, I, everybody, I think all big corporations are thinking about the creepy part because we're trying to balance how fast do we go, how far do we go. Um, there is a lot we could know about an individual who visits Cisco.com, let's say, or any website. We choose not to know it. We choose to aggregate it because it's a little too creepy and we really don't want to know. Yeah. And, and it's not all that useful anyway to know what pages did Brian Kramer look at. And it, it, it doesn't, it's not all that interesting to a big company to know that about one individual. You want to know more. Right. When we automate it, then, then the machine will know it. The system will know it. I, yeah. One of the... Faith Popcorn is a little negative in, in my recollection. Um, some of the things that I was thinking about it too over the past week or so, and the thing that really popped out at me is, I'm going to pull one up too, is the uh, Clue Train Manifesto. Mm -hmm. That's one that I, I actually went and Googled it because I thought, oh my gosh, it's been, now I think it was 1999 this book was created, the Clue Train Manifesto. Um, and it had 94 theses, I believe. Yeah. And I pulled them back up to say, I wonder how many of these have actually come true and how many yeah. we're still waiting for. Because there was such a focus on the empowerment of the individual right. and that brands and companies would lose power. I think there's been a, you know, back and forth a little bit on both. Neither, it hasn't, the pendulum didn't swing one way or the other. It's still a balancing act. But right. I, I was interesting to go look at the Clue Train Manifesto, see how far we've come, and yet what's still yet to be uh, accomplished based on what was published 16 years ago, amazingly. Wow. Yeah, I can only imagine. You know what? I need to do that, too. It's been a while since I've actually looked at it. I'll bet it was, it's, and, and it was, it's such, it resonates so, so more, it's so loud now, even more so than when it first came, came out. You're, you're absolutely yep. right about that. Yep. Um, so, so, um. Um, you know, I don't know if, if you actually talked about this in your introduction, but um, you're, uh, uh, you are really well known at, at, at least, uh, you know, your past job at SAP and maybe even before then for being really, really strong in building community. Mm -hmm. and, um, and actually, you're one of the people that I, I completely look up to as uh, somebody who gets how to build a community. And I, I quote you all the time on that. Thank you on for that. that. I appreciate that. That's an yeah. honor. Yeah. I'm happy to. Um, so... I'm curious, and I'm sure everyone else is curious. Um, where, where, where do you think community is, and where do you think it's heading? Um, how, how do you see community today, and where do you think community could go? Yeah, I, I in the I, digital I, perspective, not in like our, our, you know, the backyard and so forth. Yeah, the um, I guess even before SAP, when I was at Oracle, I was responsible for OTN and OPN. Those are Oracle Technology Network, Oracle Partner Network which were early community uh, examples. I think it's why I got hired into SAP, is to go build a developer community. And so one of the things that we built was the SAP Developer Network. Then we noticed some people uh, were in that uh, community but weren't really developers. So we, we grew a second community called Business Process Expert Community, BPX we called it, where we thought, okay, process people, sort of uh, pr program manager, project manager, those, so, sort of folks. Um, and then we realized, gosh, we just built up a, an artificial wall in between these two groups of people. Let's tear down that wall and push them back together again. And it became the SAP Community Network. It's, as I left SAP about two years ago, we were approaching somewhere in the neighborhood of three million members of this community. It was a really, and still is, a very, very active community. Um, we had blogs and discussion forums, and we had gamification before gamification had a name. Um, we had all sorts of things that really made this special. We had advocacy programs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here at Cisco, of course, we've got lots of community. We've got, we've got um, customer-facing and partner-facing communities that range from uh, 
many around our product sets. So there's a collaboration community and a security community and an enterprise networking community, et cetera. There's a developer community. There's a partner community. There's an internal employee community. Um, so we have all these uh, uh, different communities, all of which can connect with each other, except the outside folks can't connect as much on the internal. But internal can communicate out or, and can connect out. Um, I think it's really important. I think it's the future of where we're headed. I think it's one of those things that the Clue Train Manifesto probably got right was the individual is empowered. And in these communities, ind individuals are empowered. Um, within the SAP community network, um, anybody can blog. If you are one of the three million or so members of the SAP community, you can blog, you can post questions, you can post answers, you can thumbs up things that you like and agree with, you can add on to other people's uh, questions. Same thing uh, in the Cisco community. You, not everybody can be a blogger, but most folks can be um, participants in asking questions, posting documents, commenting on blogs, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is essentially empowering the masses to do as much as they want to, um, to influence the company that's hosting them, so it might be Cisco in our case, um, to influence the people around them, so that might be product managers who are engaging in that community saying, hey, I want feature X to be prioritized in the next release of this product that we, that we use and you make for us um, and advocate for that. Um, I think it's really important. Um, so I see nothing but upside in engaging in community. I think it's, and of course there's a shareology community. I don't know if anybody knows, but there is this community uh, for the book that's coming out. I heard that there is a book called Shareology that just happens to be coming out uh, by a world famous author. And, and there's an online community that allows you to engage with the author and with the other readers of that book and people who share ideas about this, uh, about sharing and the sharing economy and all of that. So I think in, that in communities are a way where you get to re-interject humanity back into the companies that are hosting these and into the engagement. Because I think in some cases it's like we think of company, vendor, provider, supplier, and then there's customers and partners. And gosh, really all of these are people. They all want to engage with each other. They all stand to benefit if they help each other to be successful. So I think community is one of those scalable ways where we can have that engagement happen, where humanity reigns, where individuals rule, where your voice can be heard if you're able to, if you're able to leverage it effectively, where your voice can be heard to influence some, some entity that might be perceived as more powerful than you. Gosh, you can really do a lot with community. So I am really bullish and excited about what could happen and what can happen with communities. So um, I can see that's a that's a definitely a hot topic with you as well. Um, um, Love it. And uh, and and I, I I think you saw this weekend the results of your passion because everyone was even jumping on board to help support you and 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 be a part of the community. And it's it's amazing how much um, energy comes out in. A community like that, and um, and so yeah, I'm get excited. And by the way, thanks for the shout out on uh, Shareology. It has I'm been sure. an absolute you're, blast. You know, your reference to the weekend too. It's just a uh, when people get excited about something or share some share something. It might just be, hey, we all know Brian Kramer. That's it. We all, we all want him to be successful. So a bunch of people jumped on Twitter, and we were having all kinds of craziness with with hats and photos. And are you going to join us? And encouraging other people to participate uh, and ask fun questions and challenging questions. Um, there was a whole lot of that. The other is I have, I have without a doubt, the best social media team on the planet. Yeah, uh, and so they helped to amplify this. And so we issued a challenge and said, let's see how many people we can get to engage with us uh, through this H to H chat. Let's see if we can, you know, really break a record and see if we can um, uh, have more people than whoever the previous person was, and then set a bar for the next guy or gal to try to beat that record. Yeah. Um, it, it there is something about community too that means we have to stay engaged, even though it's the weekend. It doesn't count as work. Um, it, it, we're engaging with each other. We're connected to each other. We're sharing a common idea and a common interest. Let's all pull together and try to make something interesting happen. And that's what essentially happened over the 4th of July weekend of all things. 
Yeah, right. You're absolutely right. I just got goosebumps on that. Um, I, you know, one one quick thing. Um, I wanted to just make sure that everybody is uh, continuing to ask questions because in five minutes I'm going to be turning this over to Susie, and um, and she's going to get the pleasure of um, of actually uh, asking the community questions to you. So speaking of community, I just wanted to make sure that you uh, you pose your question to Mark and use the hashtag H2HChat on Twitter. And Susie is collecting them all there, and she's going to be asking Mark that in about five minutes. So just make sure that you do that. Mark, you're still at two humans. I just wanted to let you know you were okay. at the midway midway point. I always right. make sure that I at least let the, the guests know where they're at. And um, and so um, so I wanted to um, dive into the next uh, the next question, which is um, where where have you seen the mo most results, digitally speaking? at Cisco. Where have you seen the most results digitally speaking at Cisco? Where like the what emphasis would you put on on uh, and when I say results I mean clear um, benchmarks that you set and you accomplish them. Uh, well there's a there are a few but I'll give you business results. I think I would go with growing top line business. It's an area that I don't think we paid Cisco didn't pay enough attention to earlier, but I don't think any company did, so I don't fault Cisco. Um, uh, but I think most companies, unless you're in the maybe the consumer space where really driving revenue or driving new business is, is the one of the key purposes of your digital strategy, it wasn't at Cisco. Cisco does 85% of its business through partners. Um, there's a question about, okay, how much can we drive and how do we drive it? It's a little complicated uh, in a $50 billion company. Uh, that's operating around the world. So I don't think we put a tremendous emphasis on how do we drive top line revenue. I think what Cisco had done in the years prior was let's automate things, let's save money, let's get more efficient, let's get a little bit faster. Um, then the next thing became okay let's drive business. So we, we, we talked about this uh, we call it the pirate model because you say R when you it's awareness uh, reputation, reference, referrals, um, reveals, registration, <laughs> so it's an A and then a bunch of R's, R, and say you sound like a pirate. Um, so what we really did was let's drive the full funnel through the digital channel and see what we can accomplish. Let's broaden our reach through social media, for example, with reach and immediacy. Let's drive people to our web properties where then they will be encouraged to reveal themselves so that they're no longer anonymous but we get a, a name or maybe an email address or a registration or something so that we can s start to serve this person more, more uh, personally um, uh, and, and with customized content and things that might be relevant to them in the context in which they're working, that kind of stuff. Um, and so we've, we're driving, we're driving uh, much broader awareness, but more importantly, we're driving reveals and registrations um, that turn into marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads, etc. Um, we have right now we're targeting a, a million reveals uh, this year uh, in 2015, and we're targeting a billion dollars. Yes, a billion with a B uh, in sales qualified leads this year, this calendar year. Now. We might reach it, we might not, it's a stretch goal, but we are targeting now, and those are some pretty big numbers, um, bigger than some companies perhaps, so a million new people that we can market to or have a relationship with is the probably the better way to say it, and a billion dollars in sales qualified leads that the salespeople actually accept, put into their pipeline and their forecast and move it forward. So driving the top line. That's the biggest one business result. There are a number of others though. We're, not, we're modernizing the infrastructure, the platforms and the tools and so on. Uh, we're moving forward on uh, user experience and design. We're, we're modernizing and updating the design of some key pages of Cisco.com. Um, we had a really nice left brain experience on Cisco.com. You could accomplish a lot of tasks. It had a lot of features and functionality, but it didn't always connect emotionally with people. So we're trying to get the right brain part where we have this emotional connection. So we're starting to update pages. You'll see, people will see the rest of Cisco.com update over the next year or so and across the 85 country sites and 40 languages that Cisco's uh, working in. So 
Those are some of the behind the scenes, but growing top line, I think, is the one that's starting to get people excited. And it's got our CEO, frankly, uh, talking about digitization and digital as one of the big initiatives. And so if it's on the CEO's uh, radar, it's we're accomplishing something, moving the needle. You know, it's interesting that you guys are Cisco, and, um, and Cisco is one of the most technological digital companies in what you produce. And um, and yet, uh, you know, you're no different than than everyone else. You're human because uh, you're going through the same things that everyone else is. And everybody has to fight for budget. Everybody has trouble giving up of the old, giving up the old way of doing things and moving to the yeah. new way of doing things, which Machiavelli uh, talked about in the 14th century in the, in his book The Prince. He talked about how hard it is for you know somebody to give up an old way and to adopt the new way because you're not quite sure the benefits of the new thing until it's been proven and it hasn't been proven yet because it hasn't been adopted. So I mean, it's it's all same. It, the same human emotions, the same human foibles, um, the things that hold us back or move us forward, motivate us or demotivate us, all the same within a big technology company, forward-thinking technology company, as it would be in any other company. I noticed that you slipped four humans in there. I'm just going to give you one of these. All right. So, so you're you're now uh, you're now at uh, eight eight humans. So. Um, so, uh, Susie, I'm going to pass the baton here, um, and I didn't get to cover the future. I'm hoping that comes out in some of the questions that's coming through. I think it is. I've been mm -hmm. trying to pay attention to Mark as well. So um, uh, hopefully you'll get to some of the future questions so we can cover that. But, um, but Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you in the good graces of Susie. Trust me, uh, don't let the, the red hair fool you. She is – actually, let it fool you. She okay. is a, she's a firecracker. So good luck with this one. Good. All right. Thanks, Brian. All right, Susie. All right. Well, first Here of all, I have, to, <laughs> I have to say this is an absolute pleasure. It's I was so excited when I heard that uh, you were begin uh, going to be jumping on. Um, and just so one thing I've uh, I've been reflecting on, uh, especially as as you were talking about the early days of figuring out you know employees and the internet and you know all those things. And I think I, I tweeted it out. There are some of the things that you know I'm hearing, and we're hearing a lot of the same parallels now, right? Where it's do we let our employees on social? Are we doing BYOD? Are we, you know, do we limit, do we even, do we still limit internet access, right? Because some, some companies have the firewall. So um, jumping kind of, I have a whole bunch of audience questions queued up, but I just wanted to, I think this relates a little bit to the future, and I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, the um, it's funny how history repeats itself. It's just sort of you go through the same cycles, sort of recursive cycles a little bit, and we get a little bit further advanced as we go, but there is a kind of a feeling of two steps forward, one step back, something like that. The early days, I mean, in the early days it was, gosh, we shouldn't give people Internet access because they'll be goofing off, they'll be surfing the net is the phrase, um, what's the ROI? And then I even went backwards further back then and said, okay, well, what is the ROI of having a telephone on everybody's desk? Won't they be calling their neighbors and their friends and their family all day long? No, we figured out that it's a communication device. It's a tool. It enables them to be more effective and more efficient and more impactful. So everybody gets a telephone. Now, the Internet is, let's put that in the same category. Web access or the Internet access is the next um, thing that we need to let people have access to because it's going to make them more productive. They're going to be able to um, be quicker, uh, answer questions. You don't need to memorize everything. You can store it on a device, all that stuff. I think social media is, is one of those where people still don't, some people still don't quite get it, and they still revert back to that old, I hate it, but, mm -hmm. but people say, oh, it's what I had for breakfast. I, I will tell you that I've been on Twitter since early days, um, and I have probably seen maybe once or twice when somebody's talked about what they've had for breakfast right? in, the, in the midst of millions of tweets. Yes. And so it's yes. not that. It's this weird thing that somehow caught on that everybody's just goofing off. No, that's where I get my news. That's how I find out what's going on in the world. It's, social media is where I get connected to people and stay connected with them. Um, even my own family. I mean, I have a son on the East Coast in Philadelphia um, I stay connected to him more than I ever was connected to my parents when yeah. I was his age. Um, and even though he's 3,000 miles away and I'm off in the Silicon Valley, uh, 
we still talk on the phone and do all that stuff, but I know what he's up to on a day-to-day -day basis where my parents never knew what I was up to, thank goodness, on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so my parents actually tune into H2H chat. I'm uh, oh, 3,000 miles away, so they tune in and they go, yep. oh, you know, how's it going? Um, yeah. They're small business owners, so they, they really good. enjoy it. Uh, they Hi, get mom, to know my you dad. Do. I even understand what you do. Hey, hey, I mom and dad. Yeah, hey, actually, mom and dad. yeah, my mom Glad the other day you. the other day said, you know, okay, after five years, I actually get what you do, and I was like, yes, what every social strategist wants to hear, right? Yes, right. get people <laughs> to engage with each other. That's exactly. it. No, and I, I absolutely love it. So, um, let's let's jump in. Uh, some a really really great, I think. Uh, a definition question that popped up and so so key right so um, this uh, handle teed Q um, said how do you define community oh gosh right the simple um, ones but the complex ones. <laughs> yeah that's a hard one. that's yeah. that's a little bit hard because gosh you could go in so many directions here's the thing that I think about um, you can have you can have uh, a development like with houses and streets and parks and all the rest you can have a neighborhood or you could have a community they are they're all made up of streets and houses and shops and whatnot um, but community feels tighter um, it feels more interconnected it feels more networked it for, feels more inter codependent let's say um, more intertwined um, and so that's that's one of the characteristics that I think about for community. Yeah, it's it's one thing to live in a development. Eh, that's not doesn't sound very warm and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, it's another thing to live in a neighborhood, but it's really just a section of town. But a community, gosh, that's really something special. I live in yeah. a community right now. It's one of the reasons why I live where I live and still have a long commute uh, home. Um, but I live in a place where people get together all the time. I see neighbors on a regular basis. We have a thing called Sunday Night Supper Club, and every other Sunday we essentially do a potluck at somebody else's house, Love and this that. is like professional potluck. I mean, these people know what they're doing. At <laughs> 6.01 p.m., your doorbell rings, 30 people come in, set up their stuff, and at 8.30, because it's Sunday night and everybody's got to work on Monday, at 8.30 p.m., everybody picks up their stuff, heads out the door, and we're off, right? Nice. But that's a community. We get together on a regular basis. So that's what we try to commute, what we try to create with companies and its customers and its partners. It's a place where we can all get together, where we can share ideas, we can argue, we can help each other, we can disagree on things but still stay friends, um, we can attack the idea instead of the person. That's really what community is. I love that. I, I just moved into a place with a community too and I've been, it's the first time and I've been raving about it and just been, been shocked. I love that offline example. Um, so kind of moving into this, um, jumping into, you know, in, in some ways the, the ROI challenge, right? Because at the end of the day, there, we do need to demonstrate mm -hmm. ROI. So um, Alan Berkson, a, a fresh, uh, fresh desk, one of our uh, one of our shareology sponsors, um, love Alan, uh, says, "How do you measure success for your communities?" Uh, in the early days, you you measure it by um, things like um, how many visits, how engaged are people, how many questions are answered, how fast are they answered. Did I in the Many early communities are tech support kind of questions or tech support kind of communities or product support questions, communities, sorry. So <laughs> then, the, then the idea is, well, could we, did we do some cost avoidance? Did we do some call avoidance? An easy thing back in the day was, okay, it costs us about $100 per question to answer a tech support question at a high tech company. You've got to pay for the person and their salary and their their desk and the building they sit in and the, their computer and the tech support and all the, it's $100 a question. Right. Okay, how many questions were answered by the community instead of by somebody we had to hire? That's an easy way to do some ROI. Um, the, uh, the other is, I think we're not there yet in understanding the amount of influence that a community would have on the next purchase decision mm. or on loyalty or you could look at things like what does it cost me to acquire a new customer versus to retain, upsell, cross-sell uh, an existing customer because their loyalty is higher and their connectedness is higher. So those are the kinds of things that you look for in a community. I love that. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes that makes absolute sense. Um, so I, I have a, a great question that just popped up, um, but I want to push it push it to the front um, because we want to make sure to talk about 
uh, the future of digital, it's yeah. Gladys with a W. So shout out for an epic name there. Um, yeah. She wants to know, uh, what is the future of digital beyond communities, IOT, IO, every T? Um, yeah. She says, can it be digital humanity? It could be digital humanity. Um, the uh, I think the idea is, number one, automate repetitive tasks. We, we mentioned that earlier. Then there's connect everything to everything else, even if it seems stupid. Like, why is my refrigerator connected to my pantry? I don't know. Um, that doesn't seem right. Or connected yeah. to my car. What does that have? To, well, it might. we might come up with something later. Then there's going to be self-learning and continuously improving networks. Um, so I think there's apps and services, essentially smart machines. Machines are going to get smarter and smarter and are going to be able to anticipate our needs and requirements. I think we're going to move beyond algorithms, which people will invent, yeah. to more rule-based. Like um, birds that fly in formation only have three rules, right? It's move forward, it stays close to the bird to your left and right, but don't crash into them. That's essentially what makes birds fly in flight, fly in flocks and not crash into each other and just have chaos. Well, those three rules, we could make up some rules and have the machine figure out the algorithm that helps to keep improving that. Hmm. I think there will be entire organizations that uh, become more digitized or digital. I think um, customers are going to get a lot more empowered over time. Go back to that whole clue train thing, that, that thread that I was on earlier. I think customers are going to be a lot more empowered and there's going to be a balance of power. And I think this personalization and audience of one is going to also happen. So I think those are some of the things that are coming. I yeah. think IoT or IOE is going to be at the center of it because all sorts of people, processes, data, and things are going to be connected to each other. Um, and all of and this whole internet of everything is going to move uh, us all forward. It's going to be a really interesting future. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I love Jay, that. Just, um, just throwing this out there, J.S. Gilbert. Yeah said, uh, who's, a, who's a good friend of HTH Chat, he said, I'm glad the machines are getting smarter and smarter because I'm getting dumber and dumber. <laughs> <laughs> well, you That's know, that yeah. might, think of what I used to, my grandfather, when he was alive, would he would still recite poems that he memorized back in the day. We don't have to memorize stuff anymore. We have Google or Bing or whatever, you know, DuckDuckGo or whatever your favorite search engine is. We've got repository where the facts can live. We then need to do the reasoning, the important stuff. So in some ways, we can get dumber. Like, I don't remember anybody's phone number. My wife's, yes, right. I remember her yeah. phone number. But other than that, there's nobody's phone number that I can remember. Hey, Mark. It's all in my device. I don't really need to know that. So I have removed that out of my memory banks. I have cleared that space for something more important like... I don't know, Angry Birds or, you know, <laughs> Facebook or something I, ridiculous. But I don't have to know all that stuff. I, I told my wife if I, if, if I ever end up in jail, chances are I won't be able to contact you. <laughs> yes, yes. <Yeah. laughs> I still remember my phone number as a kid. I bet everybody does. I still remember my phone number as a kid because I had to memorize it. But all yeah. these other phone numbers and other facts and stuff, I don't really have to know it. I can look it up. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I have the, the same exact thing. I, I know my husband's phone number, but I don't know my parents. I tweet yeah. at my parents, right? I text, <laughs> you know, it's all oh, automated. I just heard that if they're watching. There we go. I tweet at them. Um, but yeah, and that's, that's always the devastating thing, right? When you lose your phone and you see the Facebook messages or Twitter messages that say, yes. please, you know, send me, yes. send me my number. You know, it's always, it's a total crack up. So, whoa. Wow. That's that was okay. that was meant to be. That wasn't. I didn't know that sound Morning. would do that. I meant to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that was you like the doom of the yeah. future, right? Like, <laughs> ah, robots yeah. are taking over the world. Yeah. This is not good. We're gonna be piles of sludge. Okay, so I have I have a, a great question. I want to um, jump to kind of. We may end up and uh, ending on this as well. Um, so uh, Donna Peeps. Um, tweeted and said, how do you think about the customer amidst all of the automation? And where does employee engagement and experience fit in? So that's, that's a big question, right? Yeah, but, that is. You know. But I think, well, w let's take the first part. One is customer. The good news is the customer is moving to the center. Um, so that's really good. I think I've heard, back in the early days, we talk about UI. We even talked about um, 
HCI. Does anybody remember that three-letter acronym, which is Human Computer Interface, I think is what the three letters stand for, which was how do people engage with machines? Um, mm -hmm. That was back in the early days. Sun Microsystems, I remember that being a topic. Um, then it turned into UX, so it wasn't UI anymore or design, it was UX, user experience. That's much broader than design or UI, and just that interface of a person and a, a human and a machine. Um, and now we're really talking about customer experience. Yeah, customer experience is the new phrase, right? It's CX, yeah. it's not UX. So I think good news is the customer is moving to the center of all this. Now, we're all trying to attract customers. So um, the, those of us who do a better job of it are going to be the winners. Um, I think customer experience is going to be the new differentiator as we go forward. So um, that's 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 one piece of good news is customer doesn't get lost in all this in digital in digitization or digital. The customer is the reason for it. We're trying to do a better job to help that customer be successful through content, tools, access, um, power. Um, the power to publish, all that stuff. Gosh, we didn't even talk about the difference between sort of Web 1.0 and Web 2.0, where the power yeah. kind of shifted from yeah. big companies publishing out into the world to really let's now connect customers and partners and employees together so that we can together solve the customer's problem, because that's what we're all here for in, in the first place. So customer experience is really important. Then we talk about employee engagement. I think that was the, the next part of this yeah. was, yeah. how do we engage employees and all that. Well, the good news is employees can now engage with customers directly through social media like they never could before or through community. That's another aspect of social media. Um, they just happen to be hosted. So back in the day, uh, it, unless you were a sales rep or a service engineer, you never saw a customer, you never talked to a customer, you never understood a customer. Nowadays, we all get to engage and interact directly with customers because we have social media. So I get to talk to customers all the time on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, SlideShare, in our online communities at communities.cisco.com. I can, I can engage with them by publishing a blog at blogs.cisco.com and they comment and ask questions. I share things in LinkedIn groups, uh, all that stuff. So all of us get to engage directly with customers. We also get to engage directly with each other so that we can sort of behind the scenes say, okay, what are we going to do? How can we do a better job? How are we going to help our partner? How are we going to help our customers to be more successful? So I think employee engagement um, with each other for the purpose of driving business, driving better customer relationships, et cetera, is, is all good news. And the fact that customer experience is, is really the center uh, centerpiece of topics and the trends that the memes that are going on right now, um, I think that's all good news for that question. I love that. Uh, topic area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you, Mark, so much. And I have to say, this was just the tip of the iceberg of the questions. So I know, I know you're super busy. But I know, you know, I know your team is there, but um, you know. Diving into this, we have some amazing conversations and some people to whom I think you're their new hero. So look good. for a lot, oh, look for an upswing, okay. upswing in your Twitter oh, followers good. in That's the H2H community. <laughs> I I will commit. I will. I, I may not get it all done today or maybe even tomorrow because I'm sure there's lots of questions that we never got to. But I will commit to. I will engage on Twitter. And I will look for the H to H chat uh, with the hashtag so that I know what we're looking for. Yep. And, uh, and I'll look for the questions that are relevant to our discussion today and go back and answer as many as I can. I bet other members of the Cisco family and social media team and others will dive in as well. I really, I thank you both, Susie and Brian, for having me. And thank you to the audience for great participation. And really. Mark, uh, to credit your yeah. social team, you have had tweets from just about every social handle at Cisco coming oh, into good. tweet chat, so that shows the uh, yeah. the the support system you have you have there, and I am and, and I noticed so that they're, impressed. Yeah, yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. Really, so, really good. They set so, the bar for social media. Love so it. Uh, just just real quickly, Mark, I wanted to uh, thank you again for for showing up, and also um, for everyone out there who has listened to this. It's a special edition of HJ Chat. This is part of the Shareology series. And um, and and uh, Mark is a is a big supporter, and so is his team of uh, Shareology the book. They've had me 
there at Cisco to speak and and also um, are a uh, partner with Shareology on the the community website. So uh, so thank you very very much, Mark. I really appreciate your support. It means a lot to me, and and um, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Happy um, to do it. We believe in what you do. Thank you. Thank you, and and also um, to uh, the other sponsors in support of of this series, I want to just give a quick shout out to uh, New Star, Mastercard, uh, again Cisco, IBM, Little Bird, Hootsuite, Fresh Desk, Speakeasy, Influitive, who's powering the community, Mutual Mind, and and Cox Communications. So um, thank you to everyone who's who's helping to partner the on on the Shareology series. The book comes out on July fourteenth. Um, if you are not in the in the Shareology community, please, please, please ping me, and I will get you into the community. Um, you can also check it out on ShareologyBook.com, and it's also live on Amazon, so you can just go look up the book and purchase it there, and 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 I would appreciate that. But otherwise, um, we will see you this upcoming Monday again at noon. We have a great series uh, this time with uh, New Star, and it's going to be a panel of of people. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and, and we'll, we'll have a good time. So uh, check back in next Monday. And Mark, thank you once again. I really appreciate it. You have just one more human to break the record. Is there any parting okay. words you wanted to share with everyone? Well, I wanted to ask people to look for your book, Human to Human, the first one. Uh, as you're on your way to buy Shareology, pre-order it on Amazon or some other place. Join the Shareology community. And uh, and do drive more humanity back into social media. <laughs> Show a personality for your company, for your brand. Um, please do engage with us. I'm happy to ha happy to engage too. So thank you to all of the humans who joined us today for our H to H chat. Awesome. And one more for for uh, a bonus score. So uh, thanks for breaking the, the record. And we'll see you guys all again next Monday on H to H chat. Thanks once again, Mark and Susie. A uh, hat tip to you as well. <laughs> it's been great. Bye, all. Bye, guys.